Michael said, my name is Dave Olive, and I'm the general manager for Shoshone Energy. Uh, we're a division of the Northwestern Band of Shoshone Nation. The Northwestern Band of Shoshone Nation is a tribe whose indigenous lands uh, encompass northern Utah, southeastern Idaho, and northeastern Nevada, and southeastern Oregon. Uh, back in 1863, the tribe uh, was up in, near Preston, Idaho, in the winter and uh, was massacred. They lost over 500 of the tribal members. And the reason they were up near Preston, Idaho is because of the geothermal up there. They would winter up in Preston area because of the warm water that would flow into the Bear River, as well as the geothermal that would heat the ground and, and make it so that they could keep their horses up there and have dry encampments. I'll be talking today about geothermal. Geothermal is, as the name implies, earth and heat. So the earth provides a lot of resources that we uh, have exploited over the years, all the fossil fuels, uh, renewable energies, wind, everything that uh, we have comes from the earth or the sun. Currently, uh, geothermal power plants represent about 8,200 megawatts of electricity in 21 countries, supplying about 60 million people worldwide. And that number is growing. There's a, uh, there's a huge push to build geothermal power uh, power plants because of its baseload attributes. It, it's available over 97% of all the hours in a year. And it's a good uh, substitute for coal, natural gas, nuclear uh, power plants. The first geothermal power plant was actually built in 1904 in Italy. This kind of looks like a moonshine still, but uh, you know, it produced electricity at that time. And the, the source of this geothermal today is uh, this power plant right here. Those cooling towers do not uh, just, a, they're not just used at nuclear power plants, they're used at geothermal power plants and other types of power plants. So this resource has been there producing electricity for over 100 years. This is Old Faithful, as most of you realize. And a lot of people associate surface anomaly, uh, geothermal surface anomaly with actual location of geothermal power resources. In some cases that's correct, in others that's not accurate. Okay, This well right here is the first well that was drilled at the Geysers geothermal project in Northern California. Eventually the Geysers was built to uh, 2,000 megawatt capacity, which is larger than the Intermountain, both Intermountain power plants up near Delta, Utah. Uh, currently, it's at about 600 or about 700 megawatts capacity. When when the people originally started operating this plant, uh, they didn't replenish the aqua or the uh, geothermal resource, and uh, so it had a, it experienced a, it experienced significant decline. But once they figured out how to replenish it, then it's maintained at about six to 700 megawatts. Currently, they pipe uh, gray water from Santa Rosa, California, up to the Geysers project so that it can maintain its output. Geysers project is actually a cluster of geothermal plants. Again, it was built to about 2,000 megawatts and has 30 or 40 of plants like this one in this picture uh, throughout the mountains there in Northern California. And as we all know, geothermal is a, a, a clean and safe uh, way to produce electricity. It's renewable and sustainable, and uh, it's a very good, oper a good operation for baseload power. It's very cost competitive with, uh, with fossil fuels and other renewable technologies. One of the, when, when we talk about uh, sustainability, one of the great benefits about geothermal is that the actual water and snowpack is, is the fuel source. So it's very high in uh, capital costs up front, like most renewable energy uh, technologies. But if it's sited correctly and managed correctly, it gets the, the, actual, the uh, geothermal brine resource actually gets recharged, and it it's, uh, could be a multi-hundred year resource. There are different types of geothermal technology. We have binary cycle, which uses lower uh, temperature resources. And if you look there, you have the hot water coming up out of the resource. 
it goes through a heat exchanger and then is injected into the ground. The heat exchanger has a, a liquid in it that, is, uh, that has a lower flash point than the temperature of the geothermal brine. And so what happens is, is the brine is brought up, it runs through the heat exchanger, the fluid is flashed into vapor, and then that turns the, the uh, turbine to create electricity. The, the water is then, uh, the brine is then injected in the ground at a location where, relative to the resource, it goes in and replenishes the resource and heats up again, and then it's pulled out again 10, 20, 30 years later. Another technology in geothermal is the flash steam power plant. This uses higher temperature resources that are flashed into steam and then uh, turns the turbine. It doesn't heat up a secondary fluid like uh, binary. And this is a fairly common uh, technology in, for instance, here in Utah, there are a couple of these projects, and then in California, and some of the uh, uh, projects internationally. The question was what percent of the water is lost through the process? It depends on the technology. Uh, most of our projects are bi use binary cycle technology, and so we don't lose, and it's negligible what we lose. In fact, it's a closed loop system, and so there should be no water loss on, our, on the binary technology. We also utilize air cooled condensing rather than cooling towers, and so we, we use very little water uh, to produce electricity. In fact, when uh, we have, in Utah, we need to acquire water rights, but it's just, it's a, it's a procedural matter. We're, we don't use the water associated with that water right. So Dave, I'm gonna follow up with an inference here. Uh, the, the water usage near nearby a uh, facility like this would not affect agriculture that's proximal? It would not affect it at all. But, but with the caveat that the cooling, the cooling mechanism needs to be air-cooled condensing instead of a cooling tower like you'd find on a typical power plant. Dave, is now not a good time to ask you, how many uh, potential locations in the state are being uh, surveyed right now for development? Well, there's, uh, there's a lot of places in the state that are being identified. In fact, uh, there's a task force that just completed its report uh, and it's identified several renal, or several geothermal locations in the state. The uh, Department of Interior has come out with a, about a 1,700 megawatt report, or megawatts, a 1,700 page report on uh, geothermal development in the western United States. So again, as, as uh, as we need more baseload power, geothermal will become the resource of choice for renewable opportunity. Shoshone Energy uh, is focused on leveraging technology to enhance culture. As I mentioned, the tribe was massacred back in 1863. They were out at the uh, wintering area near Preston. They were there because of geothermal. The Shoshone tribe, the Northwestern Band of Shoshone tribe is focused on economic development and um, in ways that are, uh, that are uh, uh, sustainable and that also create opportunities to build renewable energy projects. The tribe does not have a, does not have a reservation. It only has a little postage stamp of land up here uh, in the Utah Idaho border, about 185 acres. But due to the uh, passing of the Indian Energy Act of 2005, tribes can actually build power plants on non-tribal land. They can build power plants on leasehold land and still enjoy the tax benefits afforded uh, tribes. And so. That's one of the reasons the Northwestern Band of Shoshone is building our first project, which is the Renaissance Project, and we'll talk about that in a minute. We currently are developing five geothermal projects in northern Utah and southeastern Idaho of similar scale to the Renaissance Project. And uh, one of the unique features in this area is the snowmelt anomaly uh, in the Wellsville Mountains. During light snowfall, the northern side of the Wellsville Mountains actually, uh, the snow actually melts off of there. 
And so that's one of the signatures of a, of a geothermal potential. So we've taken all this data, we've got all the drilling data, all the uh, geothermal reports and things that have been prepared, and we've used that to uh, create the Shoshone Renaissance Geothermal Project, and uh, we're, we're, we've started drilling, we should hit the line with uh, production in 2010. There's a lot of geothermal resource out there, but how deep do you want to drill to get it? And you could build a 500 megawatt geothermal project, but you have to respect the resource you're driving it from. And so there's a lot of deep wells that are being contemplated, and if you can, if you can hit the resource at 10, 12, 15,000 feet, then you could have a lot of potential for the larger scale geothermal projects. Um, as I mentioned, the 270 megawatt uh, coastal project is a very large project for geothermal. And a lot of these projects are, folk, are concentrated in the western United States because of the volcanic activity that, that occurred many years ago. And it's mostly in the Great Basin area, out into uh, Utah, and up into Idaho, and into Oregon. So to summarize, to build a large project, you need sufficient resource, and, and you need to know exactly how to get it. And typically, that's a very deep, several very deep wells. And when I talked about respecting the resource, I showed a picture earlier of the uh, Steamboat, Steamboat Springs project near Reno. And that project is actually a combination of three separate projects that have been built over the years. And the first couple projects that were built there, uh, they were built as separate projects, separate ownership out of the same resource. And so each, each project owner operated their plant independent of the other and they experienced significant decline in the resource. And then uh, bought all of the projects and started managing the resource and the projects as one. And then they started experiencing significant increase. So the resource is there, but you have to manage it correctly so you don't have significant decline. Here in Utah, there's, uh, there's the renewable portfolio standard, which is a target of 25%. Uh, kind of shifting gears here and explaining why we don't have a lot of development here in Utah. Uh, this target is, is kind of a soft target. There are no, uh, there's, there's, the utilities don't experience any uh, financial consequence of, of not meeting that, unlike other states, and it's a very, it's a very long range target. Other states have very aggressive renewable portfolio standards, thus encouraging significant renewable energy development. Uh, one of the one of the other things about Utah is let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Is Utah has very low cost energy because of it being a coal state. And for instance, our GFR Renaissance project, we're selling the power to California because we can't get the price in Utah that we can get in California. But by selling to California, then that creates opportunity to use the transmission lines that are uh, going to not be used by coal as coal sales to California decline. And so one of the things that the general public, I don't think, realizes is to build the next power plant, be it gas-fired, coal, whatever, it's going to be a lot more expensive than previously. And so geothermal fits very well in that uh, cost, and it's very, very competitive to new coal that will be built or contemplated being built, natural gas, whatever the next power plant is, geothermal is very competitive to that. Well, I believe that plant is the Razor geothermal power plant, and that is, uh, and our projects are all modular as well, and I'll explain what that means. Uh, when, when you look at power production using geothermal, there are lots of ways to produce electricity. You can either go the old school way of a very large turbine. So if you want 100 megawatt production, you build, build it with a 100 megawatt turbine. Or you go with a modular approach, meaning you have multiple smaller turbines. And so, for instance, the Renaissance geothermal project, we anticipate it being 100 megawatts, but we're building it in three phases. Each of those phases has two or three modular components to it. And so the reason, one of the reasons you would do that is because you want to be able to produce electricity 
24-7. If you take and build a plant power plant with a 100 megawatt turbine, then when, you, when it's time for maintenance, you're going to have to shut the whole plant down. If you build it with multiple smaller units, then you take one or two little smaller units down, ramp up the rest, and you're still producing electricity. So it's, it provides a very good, reliable energy to the offtake and build it in a modular fashion. What was temperature can be to use this binary system? Well, it's typically about 165 degrees, but if you use a uh, technology like Razor is using, they use a technology that was developed by uh, United Technologies, and it's called a, it's for, just referred to as a Chena chiller. Basically, they're running an air conditioning unit backwards. And so what you look at is the, the difference in temperature between the resource and the ambient temperature, you know, where you are, was developed actually, I'm sorry, did you have a comment? No, no, please. Okay. My understanding is it was originally developed up in Alaska, and it's, it's uh, been working its way down here. And it's a very good technology. Um, you build, the UTC technology is actually built in very small units. I think they're like 265 kW. And so for us, at, Re at Renaissance, that's not a practical solution because we'd have to have hundreds of those small units. And so we're building ours uh, using larger larger units. Uh, Assuming from every hot spring, I'm saying there's a lot of as the water cools, that stuff uh, uh, precipitates out. How, how in this binary system you're using do you deal with that that uh, dissolved minerals that that as it cools would turn back into salt? Well, that's a very good question, and you, typically that's a science unto itself on managing the well fields. And typically you need to use some kind of a chemical or certain kinds of uh, metals so that you can it, it doesn't corrode as quickly as some other types of metals. So it depends on the resource how you would treat that. Sure. And I think coupling solar with geothermal is a great idea, especially in an area where um, you might have very high summer temperatures and the geothermal may not produce as, as uh, to its full capacity. You could augment that with solar and that's a great I think that's a great solution. I'll just talk about Idaho for a second. There's over 2,000 megawatts of geothermal potential in Idaho. Uh, until recently, it was thought that the geothermal potential in Utah was around 400 to 500 megawatts. Recent studies are showing it north of 1,000 megawatts. Nevada has, well, I, I'm just guesstimating here, but I'm thinking they're probably in the 2,500 to 3,000 megawatt range in Nevada. Uh, regarding the hot springs here, I, I can't say, uh, I can't speak to that. I'm aware of them, but I, I can't speak to it. One of the largest risks in geothermal development is drilling wells. Unlike other renewable technologies, solar, wind, you, wind you can put up an anemometer and do correlation analysis and figure out uh, what the wind resource potential is. Solar, pretty easy to figure that out, but um, geothermal, uh, I think the way that we can help increase geothermal development is to have people uh, really learn more about geology and geothermal power plants and just what's under the ground because a lot of the experts actually are dying off and uh, they're, they're hard to come by to get people to come in and do that. Can, you're, can you take advantage of the size of work done by oil companies? Hey, yes, we can. The seismic is a very large component in finding geothermal and other uh, resources like that. Well, I want to thank Dave very much.